I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we can believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there and you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects? Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. This week, we're taking a little bit of a different approach to things. You're getting two episodes of the Magnificast all in one week. Uh, so make sure you check out our iTunes feed to get both of those episodes. In this episode, we have a special interview with Magnificast field correspondent Damien Costello. Okay, he's not really that, but uh, he kind of functioned like that this week. Damien recently wrote a book called Black Elk, Colonialism and the Code of Catholicism. We're going to talk with Damien next week in more of like a straightforward Magnificast interview uh, about that very book. But before we do, Damien suggested it would help set the stage by hearing from Basil Braveheart, a Lakota elder. In this episode, Damien leads an interview with Braveheart on his connections with Nicholas Black Elk. For those of you who don't know anything about Black Elk, he's a major figure from the Lakota people, uh, and his devotion to his people and his Catholic faith makes him a really kind of important and interesting figure for us to think through. Uh, we haven't done too many episodes really on settler colonialism, especially. I think we've only done one. Uh, and way back at like the 50th episode, we thought about doing some more. So I don't know, it's taken us way too long to get around to it, but... Uh, we're trying to correct that now a little bit. So um, a little bit of background on Black Elk before we kind of dive in and, and let Damien and, and Basil take the stage. So Black Elk has become a symbol for a lot of different interest groups since the publication of a popular book called Black Elk Speaks. And that makes sorting out Black Elk's life and his identities kind of difficult. And we'll talk more about that with Damien. Uh, but before we do that, there's actually an article uh, that Damien wrote for America Magazine, uh, or co-wrote, and he introduces some of the history uh, there and, and summarizes it really well. Um, Matt, I'll toss that over to you. Yeah, so Damien writes, Black Elk was 12 years old when he participated in the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. He became a ghost dancer and fought in the aftermath of the Massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890. He spent two years touring Europe with Buffalo Bill Cody, Globally, Black Elk is seen as a teacher of what was lost, an alternative and oppositional voice to the forces of industrialization and colonialism, but most seem unaware that he spent half a century as an active Catholic. So coming off of that, uh, that little description of Black Elk, which gives you maybe like a very, very small contextualization of kind of the history that he spans, uh, Damien sees Basil Braveheart, uh, who we're going to hear from in a minute, as the heir to the Lakota Catholicism of Nicholas Black Elk. Uh, Braveheart also initiated a movement to change the name of what was formerly called Harney Peak to Black Elk Peak in South Dakota. Uh, it was first named after General William Harney, who led a massacre of the Lakota people, uh, and the mountain's name was successfully changed to Black Elk Peak, which is also the place where Nicholas Black Elk had a, a vision that would change his life. Um, we'll hear more about that vision next week, too, and they talk about it a little in the following interview. Um, Braveheart is also a supporter of the ongoing effort to get Nicholas Black Elk canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church, and Damien says there's a case to be made that the name change of Black Elk Peak can be considered a miraculous event in that process. To hear more from Basil Braveheart, you can check out his book, The Spiritual Journey of a Braveheart, from Birchbark Books, and also a series of interviews he's given with the podcast Mox and Tracks. We'll link to those in the show notes. Now we'll just turn it over to Damien and Basil. Uh, 
Well, good morning. My name is Damien Costello, and I'm a Catholic theologian that has uh, studied the life and legacy of Nicholas Black Elk for about 20 years now. And I'm here with uh, Lakota Elder Basil Braveheart. How are you doing today, Mr. Braveheart? I'm doing good. Thank you. I was wondering if you could introduce yourself uh, for our listeners. Um, my name is uh, Basil Braveheart. My Lakota name is Matowakia, which means um, looking after your people. Um, I'm, 80, I'm going to 85. I'll be 85 in October 5. I've lived here most all my life. I've, I have uh, I attended a Holy Rosary Mission, which is now Red Cloud School. And when I was 11th grade in 1951, I left for the military ser- service and uh, served in the Korean War. Came back and uh, went to college. I got a BS degree at Shadron and two master's degree, one in education administration and one in psychology and counseling, and I've been working with veterans who got PTSD because I have I have PTSD, and also people who have uh, are having issues with uh, alcohol and drug issues. Uh, I have 45 years of sobriety, so this is my passion and my mission to help uh, these people. And uh, this recent thing that happened with Black Elk, a name change, uh, has really been profound. It's I have um, people calling all over uh, for this one one thing that I, that I talk about is my prayer to Black Elk and to the divinity to help change his name. And I recently had a uh, a, a professor come from the University of Florida. He's a political scientist, but he came all the way over here to specifically talk about this out of the box narrative that a prayer a prayer and smoking a sacred pipe was the main um, the main thing that changed his name and I said yes. So that's where I'm at and I really want to stress that because we we need we need uh, we need this kind of intervention from the from the divine to to make uh, things to change things and to bring us together. So uh, before we start talking specifically about the name change, uh, I just wanted to note that you're also an author. Um, You wrote an autobiography, um, The Spiritual Journey of a Brave Heart, and you're also working on a a new work of of Lakota theology. Uh, Do you want to talk about that just for a minute? Yeah, I have... um... I've, I know a physicist um, um, <clears throat> who is from Michigan, and um, his name is Chris Quinn. And we have got together, we got acquainted for the last four or five years. And by talking together, we decided that we should write a book. He's, what he's going to do is to I'll write about uh, the physics and how it pertains to spirit, the language of the physics, which is linear and secular, but nevertheless, the information, the deep information is there. The principle is there. And also, the language of the Lakota is immersed with quantum physics. Of course, it's also mystical and it's vibrational. Um... But uh, we decided to write a book, and so we have accumulated over 400 pages of information, and it's being um, put together now, um, putting it in, in some sort of chronology, and also with the title, the present title right now is The Cosmic Tree, and uh, it comes from the... One of the most, the first time I, my grandma Lucy talked to me about all these things about the spirit is that she said, when what, when what you don't see supports what you do see. And the metaphor she was using is that we don't see the face of the divine, but the presence of the divinity is pervasive in everything, 
all in nature. His infusion of his divinity is present in water, air, light, and all nature. So that's what I think that this book's title is going to be at this point. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, we're going to come back to that image when we talk about um, the effect of the name change of Harney Peak to Black Elk Peak. Um, but before we get to that, um, overall this in this episode, we're going to be talking about the life and legacy of Nicholas Black Elk. And we're going to focus on uh, the name change, but also talk um, about Black Elk's cause for sainthood in the Catholic Church. But before we do that, uh, we should probably explain a little bit to our listeners about who Nicholas Black Elk is. He was a Lakota holy man born around 1867 and died in 1950. He's mostly known to non-Lakota people through the famous books Black Elk Speaks, which tells the story of his life up to Wounded Knee in 1890, and The Sacred Pipe, his account of Lakota tradition. Uh, Black Elk later joined the Catholic Church in 1904 and became a prominent lay leader. Um, Mr. Braveheart, could you talk a little bit about the importance of Black Elk from a Lakota perspective, who he was, and, and your connection with him? Well, yes, he became a catechist around 1904 with uh, his association with Holy Rosary Mission, which is a Catholic boarding school. But remember, his uh, vision on uh, the mountain at that time, which was called Arnie Peak, was, I believe, 1889. Um, his, his relationship with the people as a Lakota man, as a Lakota speaker and a traditional Lakota holy man, lived, he, almost, he was almost like what I would call See, the word Christ, the Greek word, means the anointed one. And what does anointed mean? Some, someone or something that models values that are consistent with what Christ brought and also what the white cow buffalo woman brought. And, and basically, it's love, compassion, forgiveness. And he exemplified that. He lived that. And so to Lakota people... We don't refer to uh, the saint, but he's elevated to a holy man. And in our tradition, that is a a uh, spiritual position that requires what I was talking about, modeling these attributes or these values as Lakota people. And of course, they're very congruent with Catholicism. And that's what to me, that's what to me that I understand from my viewpoint that Nicholas Black Elk didn't see any difference there between the values that Christ brought as a non-Christian. He wasn't a Christian when he brought these values. He later was, uh, he was, he was associated with Christianity. But Black Elk's relationship with, with Christianity in 1904 didn't change as a catechist, and he integrated both the Lakota values and Christian values, and he was very instrumental in bringing people to a place where he was um, really um, instrumental. And a lot of us who, including my grandpa Ritter, that went to church every day, and he said there's no difference. There's a lot of things that there was compatible are um, congruent with Lakota and Christ and, and, the, and the Christ's uh, um, mission. Now, you went to school with Black Elk Sun, I believe, and you also remember um, seeing him, I believe, in Nebraska. Can you tell us those stories? Yeah, I, uh, I believe Benjamin Black Elk, um, I don't know if that was his son or his uh, father. I was told uh, I was told that by uh, a short blackout, but I forgot. Nevertheless, he was a friend of mine, and we uh, spent a lot of time together at boarding school. He was a very wonderful person. Um, my parents used to go and pick potatoes um, in Nebraska because there were hardly any jobs here in reservation, so this would be over in the fall. 
one morning when the tractors were um, digging up the potatoes, we went outside after we had a breakfast, and there was a family next to this particular potato field, and it was not very far. And my dad said, oh, that's the Blackout family. And uh, he said, well, he said, well, look, there, that's uh, uh, Mr. Black Elk, who uh, uh, we certainly know, and he's a very good man. His name, his name is Nicholas. And uh, so he, my dad briefly explained how the family uh, have a lot of respect for him and how he has lived a good life. And we also try to... Um, model his uh, model his uh, way of life. He's a good man, and uh, <clears throat> he is also a very traditional man. He he uh, follows the tradition of the pipe, uh, Sundance, Sweat Lodge, and um, all these. So <clears throat> that that was a narrative my father told me when when Black Elk was working next to our to or next to our field. So that's my my first time I saw Nicholas, and um, so uh, but um, his relative Benjamin Blackout told me a lot of things about him that he really admired him and he respected him and he treated Benjamin very kindly and deep deep respect and he did that to all of us to all all the people he said. So that's my that's how I remember him. Well, uh, it was only a few years ago, uh, September 2014, where you had another experience um, with Black Elk. Uh, you said you experienced his, his presence, and that became the origin of the movement to change the highest point in the Black Hills, hills from Par Harney Peak to Black Elk Peak. Can you tell us what happened that night? Well, I used to get up about 3 o'clock and I read, and this particular morning I was reading a book by the author's name was Ostler, and the book was about the Black Hills. And I started reading that, and it got to got to the chapter where he described the massacre of the of the Little Thunder family at Blue Water, which is Luella, Nebraska, and how um, uh, General Horney's um, intention was to massacre because. Um, <clears throat> Little Thunder Camp raised a white flag and uh, he disregarded that and he went in there to talk to the Little Thunder but he gave his orders to his troops that when he gets in a, when they get in a position he was he needs a signal and, and when, that, when, he got, when he got that signal he would leave and then they would open fire with Gatlin guns and some of the larger weapons um, that canyon that they had to to annihilate uh, this uh, Little Thunder's camp. And what really troubled me was this Governor Warren, who was on an uh, expedition with, uh, <clears throat> with um, the general, um, wrote that uh, there was a unbelievable violation of the little girls that were hiding in some of the caves along the river there. I put the book down and I came down to where I have an altar where I pray and I light candles and smudge myself and I cried. And then I felt the pre when I when I smudged I felt the presence of spirit. And that presence of the spirit was Hechaka Sapa, which is the Lakota word for black elk. And so I just uh prayed and meditated and then I got up and I went to the, my bedroom and I told my wife, I said, we're going to go to a journal in Rapid City and I'm going to start um, this narrative or this movement to change Horny Peak to Black Elk Peak. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell anybody about this right now. I'm just going to, because people won't believe me. But that's, that's to me is a miracle that I have witnessed for Black Elk's spirit to come to me in my room 
it's in in a, in, in a way that it happened when I just was um, read this massacre, and it, then it, General Horney and the, the Peak came up to me, and and then the Spirit of Black Oak was. Um, there's hardly any words to explain that because um, I've uh, I've had uh, I had the, uh, the honor or the privilege I don't know if that's the way to describe it to be in the presence of a spirit of someone that uh, is is a Lakota and a holy man. So it started like that, and one of his grandsons. Brought one of his pipes, and we smoked that pipe. And my prayer for that was to have Black Elk Spirit to intercess, Black Elk Spirit to help us to change his name. And my prayer was for a higher purpose, for the, for um, to help change the spiritual vibration. And look what the word for that is shkong. And I just wanted that to be changed so it would affect our younger people and some somehow maybe something more come out of that. And it certainly has. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's, it's moving in an unbelievable um, way because I've been calls all over, all over and letters and people from from um, Belgium and France and other countries heard about this and have become interested. And this is something that I quite don't understand yet, um, how that is. But also the miracle to me is to change all the minds in this, in the, the people who oppose this. Mm-hmm. The state senate, the state house, the governor, and um, John Toon, who's a <clears throat> senator, opposed this, and they were going to put it into this whole movement. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, it went silent. Well, and I, I don't know uh, what happened. If I could huh? jump in real quick, Mr. Braveheart, um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how after you went to the South Dakota board on geographic names and suggested that uh, Harney Peak was an offensive name that needed to be removed, um, there were a number of hearings held across the, the state, and um, there was some pretty strong opposition to your idea, right? Absolutely. Our first one was in Martin, and it was 100% uh, supporting name change. Our next one was in Custer. That's where um, it was very challenging. It was very challenging to stay in your center and remember the prayer that you made with the pipe because. They were very offensive, very uh, racist, and very disrespectful. Um, and um, when I got up to talk, I, I told myself, I'm not going to go and def- defend um, what you have said here. I'm just going to um, say that it needs to be changed. And I also said that at that time, I said, if this, I wonder if this name was Hitler peak, would you change it? And uh, I didn't get any response. But some of them didn't believe that uh, Horny, General Horney did this. Mm-hmm. They implied that you guys are just making this up. And why change history? And so I never saw any Indians up there praying. What more do you want? You, you want this change, and then you want something else. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I said, well, I think, I think this is just the beginning of bringing things to where it should be, because we're talking about a holy site, mm-hmm. a site that Lakota's honor and uh, the Black Hills is the heart of the nation. It's the heartbeat, and, and it's also the genesis of the of our of our people at Wind Cave. But uh, for for us to be close together like this. Custer and the reservation, they they knew nothing about us. And but so also this name change is causing different groups to begin to come and want to learn more 
about the Indians, Lakota people, rather than being museum Indians, because that's how they see us. But I think there's something more that's coming, that's happening. I can't believe it. I just can't put my finger on it, but it, it's happening. Well, so when the, the feds, federal government stepped in uh, August 11, 2016, um, the U.S. Board on Geographic Names officially changed the name to Black Elk Peak. And there was a great outcry to this move among many elected officials in South Dakota. You referenced this. Um, but the opposition was very strong to this move by the federal government. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and um, the sort of anger that, that you felt? Yeah, um, I felt the anger. I felt um, a lot of racist remarks. Um, but I didn't allow that to define me. And that again comes from my grandparents who taught me that they that 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 teaching was powerful. Yeah, um, there are some people call me and they congratulate me, non-native people. But also, I had a friend who was keeping track of all the uh, most of the comments on Facebook, and he says. There are some good comments, but most of them are racist. And I said, they, some of them don't even know you. Some of them, they don't know you're a veteran, and you're a combat veteran, and you've been sober, and you try to help veterans, and you try to help people with sober from alcoholism. I don't, so he said, that tells, tells a lot how this, how this sudden voice, the, the, the shadow of hate, the shadow of prejudice is has really surfaced. And uh, I said, I kind of figured that that was going to happen. But I said, we gotta, we got to go through this because we got to know how, see how bad it is before how good it can be. And we need to come together and eventually sit down and dialogue all this that we're experiencing. But I said, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to navigate this through the spirit of black elk and also the teaching of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to allow this to define me. In, in fact, um, I think that changing the name is going to change how people see the courts of people. And exactly that's kind of happening where people are wondering how this happened. And they still are amazed. You, you keep saying, you mean that you, you pray to black elk and smoke the pipe? And you, you think that that's what changed the name? I said, yes. So you talk about um, the opposition, which was, was very strong, very vocal in the aftermath of the name change, sort of dropped away. It, it disappeared. Um, and you talk about that having a mir miraculous nature. There was something miraculous about that. What happened to the opposition? You know, I there's no logical explanation of why it went silent. But to me, I look at the English word, the word called miracle, and there's different definition of that. It is a divine intervention that causes something to happen, and that's exactly what happened. For all, up to me, the reason why I'm referring to is a miracle because we can't begin to count the minds, all the people in South Dakota, all the elected people that were opposed to this. That's a that's a hardwired neurological position they took. Hardwired position to take. That's logical thinking means it's tunnel vision. Once they make those decisions, I don't think a workshop or a book or a sermon could change these people's hardwired minds. But it took the divine. It took an div intervention of divine. It, I think that's really what happened. To change these people and to go silent and let it go. 
Is that what happened? We can't find out. There's no way to determine that. But the end result is to to ha- to have his name changed. That's the result is what I'm basing this miracle of the name change. Now, one of the more interesting things that you talk about is that the name change was not just symbolic, but had a real effect on the land and on people's consciousness. And to bring this back to the image of the cosmic tree and uh, the teaching of your grandmother, um, that there's some real, I think you use the term, spiritual sculpturing going on through this name change, through the land and extending outward uh, into the world. How do you explain that? Well, um, I use a sculpture, and the best word I could come up with, I was trying to um, use uh, use some language that uh, the audience would understand. But this, the word that my grandparents would use would be, Wawakon Wichoka. Um, to me, when I when I hear when I hear that, then it includes molding. It includes um, an intervention of the skull, something in sacred motion, and motion is divine. Everything in the universe is in motion. So I said, well, I'm going to use the word sculpturing. Is this divine skull? Is this divine movement? That's on in a in the most cellular way has caused the the name change of Horny to Black Elk Peak to in fact also reawaken its original vibration that the skull it has molded the the rock, the earth, the vegetation, the trees to to have a higher vibration. The Earth vibrates 7.8 megahertz. But when we had that ceremony below Black Elk Peak after name change, there was an there is definitely an evidence of a different presence of a divine. And to me, I don't think any scientist went up there and and uh, did any kind of re, um, test. And I don't think that uh, that would make any difference. But people are coming. I'm, I'm going to host another large group of, of doctoral students from the from Minnesota, from Augsburg College, in two weeks. I, I did it last year, and their primary purpose for them to come and say, "We want to experience a sacred site. We want to experience the name change of Black Elk Peak. We want to experience the." the energy and the vibration that you talk about. And when they went up there last year and came down and we got together and talked about that, they did. You can't put a logical, secular um, explanation to it, but something, I think it also is awakening many people's, whatever one we call it, their, their divine, their divinity, that when you awaken as a result of, of something like this, it is profound. Mr. Braveheart, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation um, and ask the question how um, the name change of the mountain um, relates to the cause for canonization, how these two movements are really the reflection of Black Elk's continuing living presence. And we look forward to that conversation. Until then, Doksha. Doksha. We're talking to Lakota elder and author Basil Braveheart about Nicholas Black Elk. Thanks again, Mr. Braveheart, for joining us. Thank you much. Now, we've been talking about uh, the name change of Harney Peak to Black Elk Peak, uh, the highest point in the Black Hills, and its spiritual significance. And we're going to transition in a little bit to its relationship to the cause for canonization in the Catholic Church. But 
First, I think we should talk a little bit more about land. I think most people understand that it's it's not just a symbolic change, but we have a difficult time grasping its meaning due to our understanding of land and our relationship to it. Most of us inherit a secular Western perspective that tends to see land as inert matter or a commodity, an object to be controlled. Uh, you talk about that quite a bit, Mr. Braveheart. Yes. What's your uh, perspective, um, the Lakota perspective? You talk about taku wakanshkanshkan and how that uh, infuses land. Our, our cultural or spiritual belief is that all creation is infused with divinity. And there are two very important uh, spiritual ingredients that are part of that, and that is we use the word Dakuwa which means everything is in motion. <clears throat> everything is a verb. That's that's basically our our foundation of our language. So everything <clears throat> is in motion universally, cosmologically. And the other ingredient is everything <clears throat> is connected and related like a web. I use a spider web as a metaphor to describe that. <clears throat> so when we <clears throat> when we um, our, our observation and our belief is <clears throat> in this particular case the Black Hills are all in sacred vibration. <clears throat> and so when we change the name we what we did was we just um, reawakened the original spiritual um, <clears throat> sculpture that the divine sculptures this whole planet in the in what I just said. So when we the original names were many other sacred names and so what we did is just uh, you might say we we uh, we sculptured it or <clears throat> we energized it or awakened it to awaken it awaken the whole black hills in this case um black elk mm -hmm. so in our belief <clears throat> um <clears throat> Does this particular mountain awaken to a higher vibration? Yes. Generally speaking, um, um, <clears throat> physicists um, <clears throat> refer to a number or design where the Earth vibrates at 7.8 7 .7 megahertz. Um, I don't know if that's congruent with our our spiritual vibration. I don't know if you can measure it, but you can intuit it and you can ref you can feel it. So that's basically how we see um, the earth, the sacred earth, and our sacred mother. And we are we also have awakened the 3.8 billion year old feminine principle that is what we need to listen to. There's that great image of Nicholas Black Elk uh, when he went up to Harney Peak, to Black Elk Peak now uh, with John G. Neihart after he finished the interviews and he went up to pray and he told Neihart that if he had any power left there would be a little bit of rain and it was a cloudless day and uh, as he prayed, out of nowhere, a little cloud came and um, sprinkled a little bit on them. Just an example of that sacredness of the space you're talking about. Yes. Um, um, I think that I'm going to say this, that all human beings... If you go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years to their original language, they probably used the same 
amount of vibrational sounds that indigenous languages use. Lakota has 140 sounds. So that that's a huge that's a huge part of how we how we perceive how we understand um, creation and so if you have a language that vibrates 140 sounds then that's a that also is a frequency and that's electrical but all, it's, it's spiritual in nature so uh, my belief is that if we use a language that vibrates at 140 sounds or frequencies, is that does that is that does that align with the, the vibration of divinity? I'm saying yes. Mm -hmm. And so, for a Lakota to <clears throat> to see this, it's already the neurological structure the synapses and the vibration and the structure of the, of the brain has already been awakened to that state of divinity. And so it has, it goes into knowing that that's what, that's what is there. And that's what we experience. So, it's, and so it sounds like what you're uh, alluding to is that um, this teaching of the land, the, of the sacred vibration is, something not that you're introducing or that black elk is introducing to to uh, the peoples of the world but calling them back to this understanding that this uh sacred relationship with the land is uh really part of the christ principle and you hear echoes of it in the teachings of christ and in the bible itself well <clears throat> i'm going to say this if you study the aramaic language and the way Christ described it, if you do the uh, Beatitudes, or the Our Father in Aramaic, it's it's different from what it is in the Bible. So I always say, if the Bible was interpreted in the language that Christ spoke, the Aramaic language, we would see we would see we probably see it the same way the natives do with, with the sacredness of the land. Mm -hmm sacred sites it's it's the language because <laughs> I've been studying Aramaic and the Aramaic language is very it has the same vibrational it has the glyphic petroglyphic um, vibration it's pictorial and it's connecting it is hard to, this is really hard to describe because we're talking about a very profound, deep linguistic vibration in a quantum world. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm talking some language here that I, I have been studying for 40 years, so I know a lot of people won't be able to understand that, what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, regarding the, um, the name change, um, you talk about the effect uh, is similar to um, like a stone being dropped into a pond. And for you, the cause for Black Elk's canonization in the Catholic Church is, is sort of an extension of that event. Uh, how do you see the, the two related, those two movements? Well, um, remember uh, Black Elk's life was in the Lakota domain for, for uh, I think it was 19, uh, 19 um, was it 50, 19, I forgot when, when, he, when he joined the church and he started to embrace. What? 1904. 1904. Yes. When he, when he became a catechist. Mm -hmm. But you see, he was able to integrate the Lakota spiritual principles because what Christ brought and his message to the world was forgiveness, compassion, love, diversity, and much more. If you look at what the white cow buffalo calf woman brought and, and, and infuses into the pipe and into all of our, uh, to every, to all creation, it's exactly the same thing. So 
So my belief is that <clears throat> he didn't have any problem integrating Christology, because Christology, <clears throat> the word Christ is a Greek word meaning um, anointed one. Mm -hmm. And so Black Elk, Black Elk saw it a little bit differently, where he said, he think, he, I think he would, what he thought, thinking was the, anoint, the divine anointed the water, uh, the air, breath, wind, the light, and all creation. And basically, that's what Christ brought. Christ was the anointed one. Anoint, anointed one means something, someone or something that models all of his, what I just said, all of the values of the pipe and all the values of what Christ brought. Mm -hmm. And he taught, he wasn't a Christian when he talked to, he talked about the way. But nevertheless, it goes to Catholicism, and Catholicism have um, recognized and, and <clears throat> embraced this man's um, way of life and how he conducted his life in, in compassion, how he how he prayed and how he <clears throat> how he lived his life. So um, <clears throat> I think they, there was no. I think uh, Black Elk had no problem integrating the Christology and Lakota spirituality. There are some differences, of course, but some of the basic things are same. Even the even the uh, even the how uh, we see the Eucharist, because when we drink water, we we sacramentalize it, and we we the same principle is when we receive the Eucharist in a church, and also the breathing, the same thing. And also, when we when we meet this light, which is Christ said, I am the light of the world, and I think that the light in our race has the same same way of understanding and relating to the shadow, that when we when we have the light, it's, uh, the light is part of the truth, and uh, also all creation. So, um, I hope I, uh, hope I uh, responded to, you, to the question that you asked. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, just one thing I'd like you to speak a little bit more about is that you pointed out that the cause for canonization started first, but was really sort of uh, a co in a cognitive place. And it wasn't until the name changed that it really became embodied, that um, the news sort of caught fire and people started to pay attention to the cause for canonization. Yes, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I think uh, the uh, Tekawitha conference that took place somewhere in the Southwest, there was uh, some Diné woman that uh, brought to the conference that she was praying to Black Elk Spirit, and uh, there was a miracle. So I think that's part of the uh, part of the what uh, the narrative at the Tekawitha conference that um, the name Black Elk uh, or the person Black Elk. The holy man Black Elk was said, "Let's let's let's see if the church will accept uh -huh. accept him to be a saint." Mm -hmm. So that's how it happened. Then, but when we changed the name, it seemed to um, like a like a holograph that just more or less emanated in a, in, a, in a very spiritual vibration that I've heard. People call me from different parts of the world, Peru, um, and <clears throat> Belgium, and France, that they say we heard, because I knew some of these people, and so they say we heard that the name change, and also the, the saint um, is being elevated to a saint is, did it happen at the same time? So I, I just told them, no, it, the name change changed later, but I said, you know, this is people are really talking about this over here. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of some evidence on where the Lakota, when we say Marcus and Telegraph, were is <laughs> um, <laughs> really, really spread fast. Right. Well, uh, speaking of the Lakota, I wonder if you could give a local perspective on the cause. Uh, there's certainly differing opinion among the Lakota. Some are suspicious or uncertain about the church that maybe this is a way of of covering up some of their past sins um in regards to native peoples or on the other hand there's some who are who are supportive what do you see out there in the lakota community 
Well, actually, a lot of support. Remember, a lot of Lakota people have uh, have embraced Catholicism in, uh, in a very deep way. Mm-hmm. Um, and because, for me, the language is, is, a, is a non-dualistic way to 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 uh, see this, I have no problem with that. Mm-hmm. There are some Lakota people feel that, um, I don't know if the word hostage is the appropriate word, but maybe that's what they were saying is, um, did, did the church begin to recognize his saintliness and his way of life after he became a catechist, and the Lakota that I'm talking to, and I'm also in that same place where, remember, he be his life was a Lakota way of life. He spoke Lakota. He vision quest. He embraced the pipe, the sun dance, the sweat lodge, and then he became a catechist. Because, like I said before, he had no problem integrating this. Because if you if you really look at it in real deeply, there are some there are a lot of things that are the same. The most basic things are the same in in the way of life of a, a black elk. So all they want is to have a recognition that he was Lakota. He lived in what we call a Wolakota way of life. And what that means, that embraces all of the Lakota ethnospheric way of relating and navigating and negotiating their, this whole paradigm of spirituality. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's the real hope um, with this cause for canonization, Nicholas Black Elk, is that the church has recognized native saints in the past, but this would be the first time that they recognized a saint who lived so fully and completely in their own uh, native traditions, and that this was a, would be an opportunity to affirm native ways in a way that the church has not done in the past. Um, and I thought maybe we could end with the miraculous nature of, of Black Elk's death. Uh, it's a wonderful story. He, he told his family before he died that he thought maybe... Um, God would send a sign of his love after he died. And the night of his wake, uh, there was, this is August uh, 17th through the 19th, when this occurred, there was an incredible display of the northern lights. And everyone in Pine Ridge saw it. Uh, The elders remember it. The Jesuits were there. This was recorded by astronomers in different parts of North America. And this is from William Sear, a Jesuit brother who was in at uh, Red Cloud School for for decades. Um, He said, the sky was just one bright illumination. I never saw anything so magnificent. I've seen a number of flashes of the northern lights, but I never saw anything quite so intense as it was that night. Now, you've talked about the importance of light from a Lakota's perspective and in in, um, Christian tradition. What What does this event mean to you? What do you see happening? Well, it's very, it's congruent with the way the way we describe in our language that light is really present in a lot of our words. For example, when we say when a woman in Lakota is we are, and there's one way to describe that it's it's sacred light and movement. And when we say man, we also use the word we cha sha. It gives on a it gives gives on an illuminated color that has its own vibrational signature. And uh, so it's amazing that to me, knowing and studying quantum physics, that is, is quantum physics is really basically a, the spirit. It's a spirit in movement. So when when that light or northern light emanate, I certainly believe that this is a a very a epiphany, a spiritual epiphany, a spiritual theophany. 
in a Lakota was say, which Dalka Wanka ke Lila Wakaro, something that we observed and embraced and saw the vibration of the sacred light that night when he made the transition from human to spirit, from flesh to spirit. That was a sign that the only way to understand that is this man was affirmed and anointed by the sacred light, the creation of the divinity. Well, Mr. Braveheart, uh, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and all the study that you've done over the years and that you continue to do. Uh, we look forward to the completion of uh, The Cosmic Tree, the book you're working on. I uh, highly recommend anybody who hasn't seen your book, The Spiritual Journey of a Braveheart, go out and, and find it. Uh, it's a wonderful um, exploration of Lakota tradition and um, the issues that we've been talking about. Now, is there anything else that you'd like to end uh, add before we end? Well, as, well, I hope that uh, I have not uh, disrespected my Lakota people in any way because the narrative I just talked about just a while ago is my narrative and my grandma, Lucy's narrative, and my grandpa. But I've, I've tried to integrate that with some of the most modern, modern, spiritual science. I think science is is, is uh, becoming um, part of our way of life to, to help us understand the divine. And so I, I, I only, I do this so uh, my poor purpose is to help someone because it's already helped, helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for for doing this because this is bigger than than I can uh, understand. I'm just a hollow bone. I'm just a vehicle and passing this on. That's all. Well, thank you, Mr. Braveheart. Uh, have a good day and be well. Doksha. Okay, Doksha. Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Magnificast. You can find us all over the internet. We're on Twitter at The Magnificast. We're on Facebook. We've got a Facebook discussion group called The Magnificast Basement. Uh, lots of stuff going on there that's pretty interesting lately. Um, let's see, what else? We've got some stickers and stuff, some t-shirts you can get at redbubble.com uh, slash The Magnificast, I think, or slash people slash The Magnificast. Uh, and also, if you want to hear more from Basil Braveheart, and you definitely should, you can check out his book, The Spiritual Journey of a Brave Heart, uh, again from Birchbark Books, and then he gave a bunch of interviews to uh, a radio podcast called Marks and Tracks, and those notes, uh, those links will be in our show notes, and we'll hear more from Damien next week. We're going to try to unpack some of the stuff that they talked about together in the interview and some stuff in his book as well. So I guess if you have questions after listening to this, feel free to email them our way and uh, we'll put them all together. Thanks. See you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday there'll be no damn between us and our Lord